Um, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Um, so it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Prem Dabambu from uh, Computer Science Department at UC Davis. Uh, and so uh, Prem uh, is well known within the field of software engineering. He's had many contributions in, on, in different uh, areas of software engineering. Uh, he, uh, he has a talent for excelling in whatever topic he's touched. Uh, he uh, has worked on different areas of software engineering, but he's most uh, well known for his uh, contributions to um, uh, empirical software engineering, um, applying, uh, taking a kind of interdisciplinary approach to studying software engineering, applying techniques from data mining, machine learning, statistical, um, uh, natural language processing, to studying uh, the software engineering uh, problems, software engineering theories, trying to answer questions from data. Um, he's had, um, various leadership uh, positions within, uh, within software engineering. He's been the program chair of FSC and ICSI, uh, editorial board of uh, almost all major um, journals, CSC, TOSM, and so on. And uh, he, uh, he, you know, he, is, he probably has more papers in FSC and ICSI than anybody that I know. Uh, he, he's supposed to tell me tonight uh, during dinner how he does it. Uh, but um, he, uh, it's, it's great to have him here. He's, uh, he's always been the man that I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's very kind. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a, it's a, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here. Um, uh, you know, so it's a, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, so, okay. So, um, I'm going to start this talk by, um, Kind of throwing rocks, <laughs> uh, trying to make some trouble for myself. Um, so, um, so here it goes. All right. So, um, basically, over the years, there's been two major views of software. Right. Um, one you can think of as a view due to Leibniz. Um, so, I'm not a philosopher, so I'm using these more as kind of like <laughs> brand names than actual details of of their philosophy. But they're sort of a rationalist approach. Um, which kind of views as software as a mathematical object. Um, so um, you can do properties about it. It exists as a, in an ideal world as a mathematical object. Uh, the other world, the other view, world view of software is that it's software is actually a natural product of human effort. Um, it's you know it's, it's something you can study the same way you can study you know um, I don't know blood or tissue. You know it's it's a natural thing that kind of is out there and you can study it that way. And so these two approaches are, are very much out there. Um, so we'll start with the second one, the empiricist approach. Um, basically, you start with some sort of research question um, that, that uh, has some kind of consequences for software practice. Um, and you, you, you have to abstract it in some way. You have to abstract it in some measurable way. There are different, different empirical approaches, and I'm focusing mainly on the, on the sort of quantitative side of empirical work. So you define some sort of measures that abstract the research question in some measurable way. Um, then you go off and gather data from software repositories. Um, and the possibility of doing this as what has led to kind of a revolution in, in this field and accelerated the number of people interested in it, the number of research results, the number of research questions. Unfortunately, not the amount of funding, but it's, um, it's really get, got a lot of people excited and there's a lot of activity in this area. Um, and then, you know, uh, you control for confounds uh, that might confuse whatever it is the question you're trying to answer. Uh, and then you, and you try to answer your question. <coughs> so this is sort of most of what I do. Um, now going back to the rationalist approach, um, what the rationalist approach basically means is you, again, you have to sort of do some kind of abstraction, right? So. Um, uh, you define something that you're interested in formally, right? So when you, if you're just in software quality, you start with some notion of what defects are and what kinds of defects you care about. Um, and then what you do is, because of, uh, because of theoretical problems like undecidability, uh, you define some abstraction of the program property that you're interested in that you can actually compute. Um, and you define this abstraction in a way that relates to the outcome that you want to calculate. Um, and then you define algorithms that can do some sort of computation over this, this abstract that you define. Um, and then based on this algorithm, you construct a tool, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, then you prove properties of this tool, you know, like soundness, for example, right? Uh, and these properties also are defined in some way that, you know, where you're really trying to prove something reasonable. So you, know, so you sort of try to find a compromise between 
an engineering goal which may not be fully abstractable and a practical goal which is to, you know, sort of academic goal which is you're trying to prove a property about it. So you define some um, compromise, you know. So that, that, the, the, the art there is in the definition uh, to a large extent. Um, uh, and then once you've done that, uh, this is the part that I think is maybe not as well known as it should be, is that the primary way in which this line of work does its evaluation is that it's case studies, right? So it's really actually a very qualitative methodology that's used to evaluate a lot of this work that's done in, in, in the sort of the rationalist way of doing software engineering is that it's basically case studies, right? So you choose some case studies and you do a qualitative investigation of how the method applies in those case studies. Um, so, so this is sort of the, 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 the sort of the true kind of contrasting ways of, uh, sort of, uh, of, of software that, that is out there. Um, so a couple of examples of this. Um, so, um, uh, you know, one, one kind of common example in the rationalist approach to software is that, you know, is to say well-typed programs don't go wrong, right? This is actually a common slogan that I heard a lot when, uh, you know, uh, back in the 80s when I was, uh, had a lot of programming languages people surrounding my, my office at the labs. Um, so the way, the way to exploit this is to develop really sophisticated type systems um, and prove properties about them. Um, and you know, so if, if your program is well typed, then it can't go wrong. So basically, the, what's going on here is you define correctness using type systems, right? So you define what correctness for a program means is that it's well typed, right? And so the type system guarantees certain properties, um, you know, and, and you define those properties formally. Um, I, 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 and then you know, then, and then you go from there, and you do some beautiful case studies of programs that are very powerful type systems, which can be well typed and don't mix, and cannot have certain kinds of bugs in them. Okay, uh, an empiricist approach to the same issue might be something like, what is static typing in the real world? What kind of bugs does it actually help you find? Um, and based on what we learn about these type systems, uh, what kind of type systems should we be building? and defining and using, right? So the properties of the type system are less important than what actually maybe helps programmers uh, write code. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, and in my experience, by and large, these two sides don't really get along all that well. Where did they go? Sorry, went by too fast. <laughs> that doesn't want to stick around. Maybe it's too, <laughs> too offensive. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> um, so, um, and uh, you know, an interesting analog for this for this kind of debate, which is played out in much more detail, you know, just Google that term, Chomsky versus Norvig, and it's one of the most interesting debates uh, that that you will see between two really smart people. Um, and it's about the nature of, of language. Um, so Chomsky comes up with all these first principle theories of language, grammars, uh, transformational grammars, deep uh, meaning of sentences, how sentence structures can be changed while preserving their meaning. Um, you know, and all this, uh, all this stuff. Um, and the, the Nordic approach to language is basically, you know, doesn't matter what the structure of language is, what really matters is what people actually write and say. That's really all that matters. Um, and uh, so we'll study that. And, you know, so the way to make, uh, the way to make uh, practical tools uh, for human language processing is to just look at corpuses of what people actually um, say and write. Uh, and the statistical models that have proven incredibly successful in domains like translation, speech recognition, information retrieval, uh, they're actually extremely simple models. And uh, they, they tell you almost nothing about the structure of language. You know, they're just these giant statistical models that do useful things. And uh, you can't learn anything about languages by looking at them. So this is the core of the Chomsky versus Tomic debate. Uh, Chomsky basically, you know, if you, the, if you just Google it, you'll find this very long document with, you know, arguments on both sides from these two really talented people. And basically the core of the argument is that, you know, these models are useful, but, you know, they don't tell you anything about the nature of language. And on the other side, it's like, so what? We can get Siri to work and get Google Translate to work. Why should we care? Right. Um, so, um, so this is the core of the debate. But there's a lovely quote from this guy, Fred Jelinek, um, that I always use. Um, so, <laughs> so um, you know, apparently actually said this. Uh, so this was in IBM's work on speech recognition, um, you know, where he found that you know, the, the speech recognition's performance was very little, had very little dependence on, on theories about language. Okay, here's the part where I'm going to say a few things that might get people really angry with me. 
Um, so, um, so rationalism has dominated programming languages, and to a lesser extent, software engineering as well. Right? So we've been really focused on rationalist approaches. Um, and rationalists tend to operate in, 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 in their own world. I mean, it's in a, it, they construct ideal worlds and operate in them. Um, um, and, and, you know, an empiricism, on the other hand, is by its nature very invasive, right? So empiricism basically says, oh, really? Well, let's see. Uh, you know, that's the nature of empiricism. That's where you start, right? It's like, okay, you've got this nice theory. Well, let's see. Um, uh, and so, you know, so I think this is what is going on right now um, is, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on now where people are, are, um, are you know, essentially invading ramparts uh, that have been constructed and seeing whether this stuff really holds up or not. And, you know, I, you know, yes? I think an excellent analogy is with our models of the solar system over the past 2,000 years. The ancient Greeks thought that the Earth was at the center, and they had this model of everything going around the Earth and to account for the motions of the planets, they have what are called epicycles, which is small circles on big circles. And you can make that, that system work if you have enough epicycles on epicycles, you know, smaller circles on smaller circles on bigger circles with bigger circles. You can make it match the planetary motion perfectly, but it's still not right. And until a theory of gravitation came along with Isaac Newton, which, which made it make more sense, you, you wouldn't be able to send space probes to the planets. So marrying theory with observation is important because having a correct theory will allow you to make predictions much better than a purely empirical model. Right, uh, you know, to some extent I think that's kind of where the Chomsky and Narik debate is. That's exactly it. It's like we still don't have a good theory of knowledge. Yes, we can get speech recognition to work, but you know, in, in fact, neural networks carry this even more. Deep learning models, you know, nobody really even understands how, how they actually work. What, what are the features they're learning? Nobody really seems to know but they work even better, right? So in some sense, you know, we haven't gotten there. We don't have a better theory of language that actually, for example, is, provides a clear explanation of language and is computationally useful. You know, we don't have that yet, you know. And you know, in some sense, I, I don't know when we'll get there for programming, but I'm going to sort of try an argument that you know, we don't really understand how people code yet you know, very well. So I thought there was another hand up. OK, uh, great point, thank you. Okay, right. Okay, so you know, so that's you know, so I, so I'm optimistic. I think in, you know, in the future we'll have better understanding of how all these things work together, and we'll have we'll get better at designing type systems and languages and all this stuff. All right. Okay, so you know, I'm just going to throw up a bunch of ideas that that you know that have already been looked at, that can be looked at. I think that are that are you know very amenable to, to empirical study and empirical questioning and empirical refinement, with you know developing better theories and all this, right? So. Um, is strong static typing really better than dynamic weak typing? Right? Is strong better than strong better than weak? Is static typing better than dynamic typing? You know, we've done some of this, but I think we could do a lot more of this. You know, there's a lot more questions that could be asked along this, right? Um, are higher order features really useful in programming languages? Okay, I, I agree. They are probably quite useful for building data types, but once you built the data types, do they have any other use? You know, I don't know. Um, you know, the current uh, indication is that people. The only place where you find Java generics really being used is in the, in the data structures. You know, there seems to be much use outside of it. Uh, so probabilistic programming was a big thing. It's, it is a big thing right now. Um, uh, and it's kind of uh, a very exciting part of the programming languages community. Uh, time will tell. You know, <laughs> I don't know whether, you know, I guess the, the hope is that machine learning people will start writing uh, their learners uh, in probabilistic programming rather than you know, in C or C++. I don't know if it'll happen. We'll see. Um, is static analysis cost effective? Right? So basically, static analysis is an imperfect way of finding defects. So is testing. So is inspections. Um, they all have costs. Um, you know, uh, so is defect prediction, statistically defect prediction, for example. Right? So which ones work better? Well, I, I think it's an empirical question. We just need to do studies and find out, have good ways of measuring the costs of and benefits of these various approaches. And, come up with some way of measuring this. I mean, you need to do this because they're investing huge amounts of resources in all these things and you don't really know. Um, does fault isolation help programmers? Like, so fault localization, does it actually help programmers? Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice problem. There's a lot of really interesting advances in the area. Does it actually help? We don't know. Uh, mutation testing, is it good? Does mutation testing actually find real defects? And so on. Some of these have been looked at, right? Okay, so you know, um, what's the problem, right? So at the moment we're locked in, 
in a really uh, difficult dispute with one of the editors of CSCM Research Highlights. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, a lot of objections are being raised about this paper that, that we're, we're having under review. Um, and, you know, it's really funny, um, but we're having many of the same complaints that I'm going to bring about now, right? So, okay, you know, so, uh, you know, experiments can have false positives. You can find things that aren't really there, right? Um, um, they can have false negatives. You can reject hypo null hypothesis and you shouldn't have rejected it, right? That is, your experiment wasn't good enough to find it, right? Um, there are confounds. I mean, this is the source of most of our disagreements with the, the editor that's in charge of a research highlights paper which is concerned about various kinds of confounds. Um, so, you know, so basically, uh, you know, a lot of this, you know, I'm just going to, you know, some of this might be well known to you, but this is the, the big slock, billions of slock sloganeering part of my talk about why this is, why this is not as much of a problem as it used to be. So, you know, this, you might have seen this table before, right? So, um, you know, so basically, you know, uh, in your experimental outcome, you might reject the null hypothesis that basically says there is something there, you know. Um, or you might accept the null hypothesis and you might say, well, there's nothing there, right? And then there's actually the real fact. So the null hypothesis might be true, right? Um, th there's really nothing there, you know, um, or the null, uh, you know. So, 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 it's, so we're going to build this grid and, you know, you, you, you've seen this before, but just to sort of revise it, right? So, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the chance of rejecting the null hypothesis, that is, accepting the alternative hypothesis, that there's something really to be seen, you know, uh, so for example, that you know that uh, static type systems are better than, uh, you know, dynamic typing, for example. Um, so the the chances that you would reject a null hypothesis and say there is something there when they're not, that's the normal p-value, right? That's what we all hear about. This is the one that we're all familiar with, right? Um, and the negation of that is is you know is one minus that because these are two exclusive events, right? So you accept the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. That's one minus a. So essentially, the idea of making the p-value really small is that you don't get fooled. You don't get a false positive. Right? You don't get a reading that, that there is something there that really isn't. So you try to make the p-value as small as possible. Right? The other side of this, which is when the null hypothesis is false, right? Uh, and what do you find out? So that's um, <coughs> so that so that this is this relates to experimental power, right? So in other words, you know, when there's something there to be found, right? You really want to find it. Right, so if there really is an effect, you want to be able to detect it, right? So if, if, for example, static typing is really better than dynamic typing, you'd like to have your experiment actually see it. That's called experimental power, right? Um, and <coughs> the opposite of that is, we'll call it type two errors, right? So when there is something there, you fail to find it, right? So basically, you know, my argument is, you know, this is the sort of the, the main point of this whole business, billions of lines, billions of lines, is that we don't have to worry about this as much as we used to because our sample sizes are so vast. I mean, they're just massive, right? So we don't really have to worry about it as much as, as you know, for example, people in medicine or psychology have to, right? It's just not as much of an effort. As long as your, your measures are well-defined and you're measuring what you think you're measuring, it's not as much of an issue. This is why we can sort of do some really interesting studies now. Okay, so, you know, so, oops, sorry. Um, so, you know, so this, you've seen this before, right? So, I mean, the amount of data that you can get is just, you know, is enormous, right? So um, the amount of source code and the diversity in the languages, the diversity in project sizes, the diversity in number of people committing to projects, the application domains, um, you name it, there's just tremendous diversity, right? And you know, and there's non-trivial projects by the thousands that you can study, right? Even, even projects that are, have significant number of users and significant numbers of, of, um, of, um, of commit activity and defect activity, it's just, it's just an abundance. You don't have to really worry about it, right? So you know, so it's really not a, 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 you know not a big problem. So there's enough sample sizes for most studies that you want to do, right? And so this is this is the kind of arguments that we're having right now with with you know with our with our uh, with our uh, with the paper that we're submitting is that you know these these exp experimental issues are not a problem because the samples of sizes are so big, you know. So um, you know, so that you you know you've got type one errors. Type one errors are basically you've got the wrong sample, right? So you're Samples are chosen in such a way that you just happen to, you know, you happen to see something that is not really there because the sample is so out of skew. You just happen to find some programs where, you know, where you know the, the thing didn't hold. So you 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 you, you know, so you're, you know, you're you're, it's so it's so unlikely to happen because your samples are so big. You're not likely to do this. 
Um, and it's the same thing with type two errors, which is basically your confidence intervals become very narrow because your sample sizes are big. So your estimates are getting really accurate. You know, most of the time you're using these very efficient estimators where they give you fairly narrow confidence intervals on whatever it is you're trying to measure. So if there is something there, you will see it, right? So in fact, you know, in GitHub scale, uh, GitHub scale studies, you'll see extremely small effects. I'll talk about some of them. The, the effects are, you know, you have to be really careful when you look at those effects because they're small. You'll get, you'll get a p-value of, you know, point twenty zeros and one or something, and it's a tiny effect. You know, and you're just seeing it because the sample size is so huge. Um, and you know, and also, um, you know, in any of these settings that we're studying programs, there's a lot of factors you have to control for. You know, this is part of the element of the sophistication of the field, is that you know, over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of findings where we know what the control factors are. You know, because there's more and more findings. You know, we can sort of take into account the things that we know will affect outcomes like quality and productivity and so on. We can slowly start to factor these out and narrow down on the effects that we're really interested in, you know, so the effects of type systems or the, the usefulness of, of mutation testing or whatever it is we're interested in, we can sort of narrow in it by controlling for the factors, right? The thing is, the more controls you put in, you know, the more expressive your model, right? The more variables you put into any kind of, whatever kind of regression model it is you're using, you know, the, the, more, the more risky you are of overfitting your model with the data, right? Um, but you know, if you have enough data, you can handle a lot more degrees of freedom. And this is another way in which you know the billions of slot really helps us out. Is that we can we can sort of uh, te tease out tiny effects, you know, with a large number of degrees of freedom. We can still find small effects uh, because of the way because of the, the diversity and the abundance of the data. Any questions so far? Right. Okay. So uh, some examples. Um, so. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not just talking about my own work, I'm just talking about a bunch of different papers uh, uh, I, I've, um, I found interesting over the years. Um, I apologize if your work is not mentioned. <laughs> uh, not, not that I don't know about it, it's not that I don't like it, it's just, you know, just a few that I happen to pick in the interest of time. All right, um, okay, so mutation testing, right? So, you know, the, the real question about mutation testing is, okay, you know, we can find mutants, but can we find real bugs, right? Um, and so there was a nice paper on this um, in FSC 2014. And so the, you'll notice most of these papers are very new. Um, you know, they found a significant correlation between mutation detection and real-world fault detection, even when controlling for code coverage. Right. So uh, I, somebody was telling me, I think it was uh, Jim's group, that they were doing actually um, dynamic analysis on large numbers of real programs. I think that's really cool. And, and really exciting because you can do these sorts of studies, you know, uh, test case prioritization studies, whatever, with, with real systems. I think that's very cool. Um, now, th you know, this this is our own work um, about type systems, right? So is is ta strong typing better than static and uh, weak typing, right? So um, you know, so uh, type systems that fail to detect certain kinds of errors um, are weaker than ones that do. So is is, is that an important thing? Um, is static typing better than dynamic typing? So is, is Java better than Python? Um, uh, you know, is, are functional languages better than procedural languages? So we're mainly interested in software quality outcomes. That's what we were, we were looking at. So this is mostly about software quality. Um, you know, so are all these all these things better? Yes, they are. <laughs> okay. So and and you know, so we can find this effect, right? So and we control for everything you can, that you can think of. So we really want to tease out that that effect. Um, very large data set from uh, from uh, uh, from GitHub, uh, but the thing is this, right? The I guess the, the way I would say it is, don't make a fuss, <laughs> because the you know the effect sizes are on all these are really small, and you wouldn't have even seen them, except for the experimental power that GitHub gives you is so big, you know, and you know you, you can actually see these effects, but they're very very modest effects, you know, and in fact you know the controls take up most of the variance, right? So. Um, so, you know, the, and, and the thing is, we, now we understand these controls thanks to a lot of work done in Microsoft and places like that. We understand what classes factors you should be controlling for, right? And so this is the nub of our, this is the paper that was invited to research pilots but we're having a lot of arguments with the editor, is that these process factors are the important ones that we, you know, that, we, that we've understood over, you know, the last decade of research in the area. So, um, so, you know, we are controlling for them, you know, it's not that they're, we're ignoring them, we are controlling for them, and we still see a small effect. You know, uh, at very high statistical significance, there is a small effect. Right. So, you know, so this is, you know, it's a good thing to know, um, but, you know, don't make a fuss. You know, it's there, but it is what it is. 
Um, okay. Um, so uh, so we write right. So so the other thing uh, you know is worth mentioning is that even the above effects we see, the small effects we see, could be process confounds in the sense that we don't know whether the personality of people who like strongly typed languages is different from the people who like weakly typed languages. You know, I know for a fact that functional programmers are very different people than, than the rest of us. You know, I, I love Haskell, I teach Haskell, you have to get in a different mindset when you teach Haskell. Um, so, you know, so, so, you know, maybe it's just that, I don't know. You know, it is very difficult to know from this. Okay, so, um, so, you know, um, so, I, wait a minute. I skipped over some problem with my slides. I apologize. Okay, here we go. Okay, sorry. Right, okay, so another question that we looked at was uh, whether static bug finders are better than statistical defect prediction, right? So statistical defect prediction says, you know, okay, you know, we think based on past experience that these modules or methods or files are going to be defective in the next release based on the way you've been developing them, previous experience, and who's committing code, and what they committed before, a bunch of different factors. We're going to predict that these modules are going to be risky, and you should review them carefully. Right? And static bug finders, you know, even though it, they work in a completely different way, they say, we think these lines of codes are buggy you know, because of undecidability. We don't know if they're really buggy or not, but we think they're buggy. You know, uh, they may have false positives. Uh, but you, wish, you should look at them, right? Because these lines may have bugs in them, right? So in a sense, what they're both doing is saying, inspect this code, right? Look at this code carefully, because we don't know, it might be buggy, right? So in that sense, they're, they're, they're sort of compatible, right? They're both sort of requiring an additional level of inspection of the code, of parts of code that you think are buggy, but are they, uh, they, they can't tell you for sure, right? So in a sense, the cost of both these is the cost of reviewing the code, the cost of doing the inspection. The more code they tell you to review, the more time you're going to spend reviewing it. The more bugs you find in the code, the more payoff you get. Right? So you can think of this as a cost benefit. Right? You know, the more lines of code, the more work. The more bugs you find, the more benefit. So you can sort of draw, draw a, a curve. You know, the x-axis is the more lines of code you inspect, the y-axis is the bugs you find, and you can sort of pick an area under the curve measure and compare the two. Right? So, I mean, there are problems with this, you know, all measures are problems, but this is what we did. We just compared the two on an equal footing of cost benefit. Yeah. Um, so, um, and so this was in XC 2014. And um, so, you know, uh, and, you know, each is, so this is fine bugs, PMD, and JLint. Um, so, static analysis and statistical bug finding both are about equal in terms of cost benefit. Um, and they're, you know, and, and you know, and the benefits are, 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 you know, in a sense, the area under the curve benefit is about the same, but they're not both equally applicable in all settings, right? So you can take static bug finders and run it on a greenfield program, you know, something that when you only have one release, you can still run it, right? Whereas most of these statistical defect predictions, you need some project history to make it work really well, right? Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, if um, uh, you don't need any fancy engineering to build a statistical defect prediction. You just need process data. If you have a version control system, you can run it. Right? You don't need you don't need to change the build procedures to run fine bugs or JLint if it requires some you know modification to run it. The build environment is much easier to use. Right? So the one cool thing that came out of this project is if you order your static analysis warnings by the predicted probability of defects in that module, it works quite a bit better. So this sort of a nice synthesis between the two. Right? So in other words, the process factors that predict defects are also helpful in telling you where the defects might occur when you use the, the static analysis warning system. All right, okay, so, so, so this is nice, um, the nice um, kind of synthesis that we have. So the, in case you thought that I wasn't going to talk about naturalness, sorry. Um, <laughs> so this is the sort of the area that I work in now. So the rest of my talk is the next 20, 30 minutes is about this new direction of work that we've been pursuing. Um, so I won't go into a lot of technical details, but just sort of give you the kind of philosophical excitement about this area. So, um, so, you know, basically it's, you know, that software is a natural product of human effort, right? Um, it's, a, it's very much, it's natural in, in a sense that I'll explain in more detail, but it's also an artificial art artifact in the sense that it's amenable to static analysis. You can compile it, um, you can type check it. Um, and so you can sort of come up with these interesting methods that combine the statistics that you learn from large corpuses with the algorithms that we know and love about how we do static analysis. And, 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 and so on. So these, the, the synthesis of these two ideas is really exciting, and that's what you know, we've been looking at in our group. 
Okay, so in, some of you may have seen these slides before, but basically the idea is that you know, human speech and writing are natural, um, and in the exact same way, software is also natural. Okay, so uh, this was our, our uh, 2012 paper on, on, on you know, uh, our studies of large corpuses of code and showing that the statistics are similar. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so so what, what do I exactly mean by, 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 by naturalness of speech and writing, right? So um, here's a fellow who's about to have a very bad day. I think, <laughs> I, I think this was, you see the Photoshop that it was taken in some hotel in, in Rajasthan, I'm not sure, but, um, but, um, but you know, so there he is, right? And so the question is, what is he going to say if you think about his choice of utterances, right? So, you know, um, so, you know, he's got to say something, right? So, you know, so, the, you know, so, um, so, so, you know, what is he going to do, right? So, um, you know, so is he going to, you know, start reciting eloquent poetry? Um, or is he going to say, you know, get the heck out of here, right? So, so this is, you know, so my argument is basically, you know, uh, I had a great discussion with David about this a little while ago, is that language evolved my belief is a language evolved to deal with these situations. Mate selection, finding food, you know, um, you know, uh, this kind of urgency, right? Something urgent and that we needed to do right away, right? Um, you know, so the, I, you know, the argument is code isn't that different, right? So, so you know, so if you're working in, you know, in a in a big software company, you know, um, <laughs> things are not that different, right? So you, you're not going to sit there and you know uh, write down beautiful loop invariants and pre and post conditions and you know and uh, write down your web processing system in monadic form. You know yeah, it's not going to happen. You're just going to sit down and write it as quickly as you can so you get the job done, right? So um, so as a result of this, uh, you know people write code so that it's fast and easy to write and it's easy to read, right? So. So the argument here is that code is a form of communication. So the same imperatives that govern the development of natural language have governed the way we write code. And I'll have some data to back up this claim. Okay, so you know, so this is not just me saying this, and I'll let you read this quote. Um, um, you know, what, what will surprise you is who said it. Don't Google it. <laughs> You'll find it immediately. <laughs> So you know, so a code is essentially a speech act. It's an act of communication between two human beings, right? Um, so so okay. So here's who said it. So you know, I, I was really surprised by this, right? I don't think of Knuth as being a software engineer, right? <laughs> I don't think of being him being as somebody. I think of him as a mathematician, somebody who liked to write beautiful programs, with, you know, which are easy to to prove properties of. But Knuth was the one who said this, right? Um, Okay, so so you know so that's the argument you know that I'll show you some data that I'll try to I'll try to convince you that this is true that code is you know has in fact is even more repetitive and even more predictable and even more boring than than human speech right okay so um right okay so um so I'll show you a series of plots please stop and ask if this is not clear if some of you may not have seen this style of plot before but I'm happy to go through and explain this in more detail because I think this is really interesting. Um, okay, so what this is, is the relative frequency of unigrams, that is single words. Um, and this x-axis is the rank, so this is basically the most frequent, and this is the thousandth most frequent, and this is the ten thousandth most frequent. Okay, and there's two corpuses here, and the y-axis is the frequency, right? So each dot represents the relative frequency in a corpus of the most, the first one is the most frequent domain, right? And notice the y-axis is log scale, so differences really matter. Okay, and so this is the brown corpus. The brown corpus is a very well representative, a representative corpus of English from drawn from a bunch of different sources. Um, and this is, we did our best to select the Java corpus as well, so quite broadly representative from GitHub. Right? So this is just comparing the two, right? So what do you see here? Okay, first of all, they cross. They have to cross because, you know, the whole thing has to add up to one on the y-axis, right? Because it's relative frequency, the probabilities have to add up. Um, so the most frequent token in <coughs> Java is quite a bit more frequent than the most frequent token in English. So Java is actually much more repetitive, okay? And, and so this is much stronger than this plot. This is trigrams, this is sequences of three tokens, right? So you can see how much more frequent the more frequent token is in Java than it is in brown corpus. So there's a lot more repetition in the Java corpus than there is in the, in the brown corpus. 
Is this, are these plots clear? Yeah? I'm not clear what the token means, because they wouldn't be like variable names. That's not what you're counting, right? No, I'm counting everything. Just, oh. you know, just everything between, you know, just give it to a lexer, and what are the lexer spits out as a token is a token. Okay. So if one person writes their loop as i equals one to n, and the other uses j equals one to n, those are different. That'd be a different token, yeah. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not normalizing for variable things here. Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay, so, and you know, I don't know, just for, just to carry this further, it gets even more repetitive, right? So when you get to four games, it gives code, the difference between code and English becomes even more vast, right? And yeah, in what, I guess the argument I'd like to make, you know, even I buy this, the argument I'd like to make is expressing yourself in code is harder, but the imperatives are the same. You're still trying to make yourself understood. You're still trying to communicate clearly and quickly, right? You're still trying to save yourself from the tiger. It happens to be a manager, not a tiger, but it's the same thing. You're trying to write code as quickly as possible to achieve a task, and you're trying to write it in a way that people can understand you. So, and, but it's a harder language to think about, and a harder language to write in, so you, you get more repetitive in code. Okay, so, you know, so the way this is formally measured, you know, you've seen, some of you may have seen this plot in the talks I've given before, is uh, the negative log probability, the expectation of the negative log probability, which, you know, by Shannon, is a measure of the information content per token, right? So entropy is a measure of information content by token. It's log scaled, it's in bits, right? So this is the amount of, you can think of it as the amount of bits in a token, right? So the fact that each word in English has about eight bits is itself interesting because it means that each word in English is about as information as a byte. And that's a good thing <laughs> because it allows, that means that we communicate in a very facile and easy way. You don't have to think about everything we say. Uh, it means that speech organizers work better because even, even though I have a terrible accent, you know, I have a strong accent, you can still understand me even though you don't really speak English, you speak American, you can still understand me, <laughs> right? So, so, um, so, you know, this is a good thing, right? Um, um, so, um, so that, you know, that, that's, that's the, this is the reason why speech recognition and natural language processing works so well, right? So that's code, right? Code is much more predictable. And this is what you'd have expected from the previous plots I showed, right? And this difference is log scale. And, and what other algorithms you think you can use here, like, Anything you can think of, you can do that much more with this, right? The, 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 is, the, the, you know, it, this is very exciting because there's so much we can do that we haven't done yet because code is much more predictable and it has much more semantic structure, right? So we can do a lot with this. And I'll show you some of the, uh, some of the in the last few years, a lot of interesting things have happened. Okay, so, you know, so there's, there's some interesting questions you can ask, you know, is it that C, Java, and Python are just sim syntactically simpler. So is that why it's, it's more repetitive, right? So um, this is brand new data that I'm going to show you now um, that tries to answer this question. Anyway, I'd, I'd be happy to hear objections and other suggestions on how we might do this better. But um, here's what we did. Okay. So what we did is we said, okay, what is, how do we take the syntactic parts of, the syntactic sugar out of a language, right? How do we do that and compare English and, and code. Okay, so we tried to do that. The way we did it is, we went to Java and we took out all the operators, right? All the keywords, all that is gone. The only thing remaining are the names, right? So the only thing remaining are the method names, the variable names, and so on, right? So that's for Java. So can you guess how we did this for English? Punctuation. Say it again? Punctuation, yes. Anything else? Good, good observation. Stop so, words? Who said that? Did you remove the stop words? Uh, stop words. Yeah. No, no, no stop words. Function words. We removed prepositions, adjectives, conjunctions. conjunctions. Oh, pronouns. Pronouns. Right. pronouns. No, we didn't remove pronouns. Ooh. Okay. Uh, so, yes? You just convert it to bags of words rather than ordering things properly? So that's not what we want to measure, though. We want to measure order of speaking, right? The order is important. The order is what you use to understand my, my accent, right? Well, then I would remove very common words like and, or. Yes, so those are, those are called function words in English, and they were gone. That's okay, so stop we words in American, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In California, you'd have to remove the word like. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Right, we should try, we should try that. <laughs> so anyway, so so that's what we did, and you still see a difference, right? You in, you know you still see a strong difference between code and English, and you know I think this kind of captures that it's not really just about the syntax, the cumbersome syntax of Java or anything like that. It's just that people you know people, I think, choose to be much more repetitive in, when they write code. 
aren't you reusing the same method or the same identifiers though in Java? So like you choose a method name and then it means you're going to call that method name. You're going to continue to refer to the same, you know, variables, data structures, methods. So you're going to see a lot of repetition within a single program, whereas right. in a so these are document. these are trigrams, not just individual word names, right? So it's not that you're defining it in using it. These are trigrams. So the but the patterns by which you use i or you know or j or length, you know, those patterns are the same. Um, so so anyway, so so this I think and then this sort of this this tendency kind of amplifies when we get to four grams. It just same thing happens over again. We see the same thing amplified. Okay, so you know, so another kind of way of looking at this is, you know, is is uh, you know, comparing, you know, we, we compared Java and 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 uh, English, and then um, and then we actually uh, did this with just the names, and you can see again the same thing applies. Is that you know, with with Java names, with just the names, not the function words, uh, the stop words, um, we we have the same phenomenon going on. Okay, so you know, so there's a. This is not just a you know a scientific interest, uh, although I, I think it is very interesting. Um, there's been a lot of engineering applications of this. You know, so the first thing people did was basically suggesting tokens. Some really interesting work on statistical translation. So basically, the idea is if you want to port from Java to C sharp, right? Um, you know, what people do is that they you know the way the way normal English translation works is called the noisy channel model. <coughs> Uh, where you know, one way to think about it is, you know, you give me a French sentence, right? Uh, I just simply look up in a dictionary which words match which French words. I get a jumble of English words, right? Now, since English is highly predictable, I take this jumble of words in English and shuffle it around until it looks like English, and that's my English translation, right? So uh, you know, so it's really not that different from the way it actually works, right? So that's basically what they did. If they took a corpus, large corpuses of Java and C sharp, which are implementing the same thing. So they estimated this kind of dictionaries mapping between Java and C sharp, and then they did that, and it sort of kind of works. Um, so there's a bunch of papers on this. Um, uh, you know, so one from a, uh, the two groups. So one group is in Iowa, and uh, one group in ETH Zurich that have been doing this. Coding standards, learning and using learning coding standards automatically from code and deploying them. This was a group in Edinburgh that's been working on this. So again, works really well. Um, mining for code idioms. So this is not like API pattern mining. This is like deep semantic mining love. Like you know, you can mine really complex uh, subtrees um, of code uh, that represent, for example, you know, calling a method and then calling another method and then catching an exception that might be thrown and then having the whole thing set inside a loop, you know, they can mine these really complex idioms like that. This is also the same group from Edinburgh. Um, and then there's a couple of papers. Um, I'm really, uh, I'm really a big fan of these papers. So this is from Popol 2015. It's the same paper, but they did two different things. Um, one was basically de-obfuscating JavaScript, right? So basically what they did is they sort of recognized that people use Variable names in a very consistent way. So, given a context, they use the same variable name, right? So, if you say for open, it's probably going to be i. If you say, you know, some variable equals str dot length, that variable is going to have a certain name, most likely, right? Um, so, they sort of came up with this idea, and then they said, look, in JavaScript, there's some things that cannot be obfuscated, which are the API calls, right? So, given the context of the API calls, we can predict what variable names are associated with these API calls, right? So given those variable names, we can guess the rest of it and make sure the whole thing is consistent. So it's a really beautiful uh, paper. You know, it's, um, I mean, it's hard to read, but it's a beautiful paper. <laughs> um, so, um, and then the other thing they did is basically, um, they took a corpus of TypeScript programs, where essentially they learned the types from the TypeScript programs, and then they used these learned types to type JavaScript programs. And this is really exciting because it combines the type checking and the statistical guessing in one one fell swoop. So basically, it combines the type the typing constraints. You know, so if you have you know a equals b, roughly then a and b must be the same type. So they derive these type constraints and they build these into the statistical algorithm. So they sort of do these both at the same time. Uh, very nice piece of work, and I think that's what's exciting about this. This sort of this paper kind of captures the excitement of the domain is that they combine the statistics with the static analysis together in 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 in, in, in one tool. Um, there's work on, on diagnosing syntax errors. So in a compiler, you do syntax errors. It can be very difficult to localize where that error is. 
So people have been able to use language models to localize, uh, do sort of fault isolation for syntax errors. Um, and there's a bunch of other things um, going on. Um, um, so you know, this is another area that's really exciting is you know, you can use the statistics of code to do speech recognition over code or something like that. Um, so, uh, but you know, so how much time do I have? Is it, do I stop at 3.15 or? Well, you have another, you have another 10, 12 minutes. Okay, okay, good. So I think I've done, I don't about that much material. So, but you know, the code is special and, and it requires special handling and a lot of people are doing things on this now, trying to sort of understand the special properties of code and how to model it in a way that's different from natural language. Um, so, one of the things that's interesting is, you know, the, the vocabulary of code, right? So, English vocabulary, if you scan through a corpus, as you scan through more and more of the corpus, you actually saturate. So after a while, you stop seeing new words, right? So this is the number of new words you've seen, the percentage of new words you've seen. And after a while, you saturate, right? Because, the, because it's so repetitive, after a while, you saturate, right? So the new vocabulary in, code is in, in, in English is limited. Code, on the other hand, you know, you keep seeing new words, right? As you scan through a large corpus, you keep seeing new words, right? And this is not, you know, for any programmer, it's not a big surprise because of, it's because of variable names. People keep making up new variable names and method names, and they, and they keep changing, right? Um, so, you know, so for example, um, you know, um, so uh, the one thing interesting is if you split the variable names, that goes away. So the saturation actually comes back when you split variable names, so because people make a variable names out of the same old names that they've seen before. So that's kind of interesting about, um, about the sort of saturation that you see. Um, Another interesting property of code that it is, it is, it's local. So you know, I think maybe Jim, this is the point you're making is that there's a lot of local repetitiveness in code. Um, so uh, you know, so so if you look at the sort of the proportion of n-grams that occur only in one file, you know, you'll see that, for example, the, you know, these these are sorts of proportion of n-grams that occur only in one file. So you see it in one file, you never see it anywhere else. So in some sense, your language models, statistical models, are unaware of this because this doesn't happen in English, right? So it happens in programming languages, but it, it doesn't happen in English, I'm sorry. Okay, so you don't see this phenomenon in English where, where n-grams occur only in, in one file. So we can, you know, this phenomenon can be exploited. And so basically what you do is, um, you build a probability model that combines a local model with a global model, um, and you mix the two probably. So this is a, a standard mixture model, and this actually does better than, than just any one of those models. Um, so you know, you basically, uh, when you do this for English, you see the local and global English models don't give you much of an advantage. But when you take, uh, when you take CORD, you know, so that's the CORD global model, and that's the mixture of local and global models. Now this difference is actually very exciting even though it doesn't seem like much because it's about three quarters of a bit, almost a bit. And that's actually a big deal because it basically means it's twice as predictable because there's you know, reduced information content by half. So, um, so it's actually pretty cool. Okay, so uh, let me skip ahead in the interest of time. I want to have some time for discussions. Um, so uh, something that we, is going to appear in XC this year is, you know, uh, you know, programmers, you know, you have this experience with the experienced programmers, they'll like look at a module and say, that looks weird, and turns out it's a bug. Because they're so used to reading code, they have a good mental model of what code is supposed to look like, and they actually find bugs in, you know, very quickly in that way. Um, so, you know, it turns out that statistical models can learn this, right? So, um, you know, by suitably tuning the model, you know, we were able to build a model that actually can distinguish between buggy and non-buggy code. Um, and there's some interesting things about it. Um, so um, it turns out that you know when you take defects of various sizes, sometimes you can fix a defect by just changing one line. Sometimes you know you have to change 50 or 60 or even 100 lines to fix the bug. Um, it turns out that the the difference is greatest for small bugs. So this thing is very good at picking up small little mistakes, right? Um, and you know so it, you know and actually you know it turns out that like actually you know it saturates pretty quickly. Most defects are and this is in a very large process. Most defects are. You know, within 15, 20 lines, you can find a large proportion of the defects. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about this is that, that defects that live a short time are really weird code, right? So defects that get fixed fairly quickly within a week or two weeks are actually, you know, are very high entropy. Whereas defects that stick around a long time are, in a sense, that people maybe find them harder to, to see, but short-term defects are quickly fixed. 
Okay, so um, I think I'm going to stop there to take some questions. Um, so I'll put this um, last slide up. So, so this is sort of the thesis of my talk, is that, you know, there's, um, you know, there's rationalist assumptions, you know, kind of have to be really looked at in a much more rigorous way than they have in the past. So now we have the opportunity to do that, and we should do more of it. Um, but, you know, because, you know, because the availability of large corpuses actually allows us to build really good statistical models of what's going on in the code and come up with ways of combining these statistical approaches to modeling code and sort of more traditional rationalistic approaches. Yes? So your, your graph a minute ago showing number of lines that need to be changed to fix a bug reminded yes. me of, um, there's this concept of deep bugs versus shallow bugs, right? right. A shallow bug is something that's fairly easy to see and fairly easy to fix, right. and then deep bugs require a lot more changes. That's and right. I forget who it was, it might have been Linus Torvalds, who said, with enough eyes looking at a program, all bugs are shallow. Right. That basically someone, most bugs, his hypothesis is that most bugs, if you, if you find the right place to change the code, you can fix the bug by fixing one line here versus 100 lines somewhere else, same bug gets fixed. That was his hypothesis. Do you have any comments on that? So, I, so I, I, that's a very famous quote, and thank you for bringing that up. My interpretation of that was what he meant is if more people look at it, somebody will figure it out quickly. That's the interpretation. I see it was an argument for inspections and code reviews, mm -hmm. right? So, and that's, you know, he was t talking about it in the context of open source software, but inherently a lot of people have access to the code so they can look at it and comment on it. So, in a sense, what you could say is that, you know, the statistical models is just another eye. And this is a very trained eye that's been trained on large corpuses of code. So it's kind of good at spotting lines of code that look fishy. You know, so and, and, you know, it turns out it works about as well as you know, static bug finders. You know, and in fact, it's synergistic with static bug finders. So if you order static bug finder warnings by entropy, you get better performance. So, yes? Um, so you said it works well in conjunction with static bug finders. Yes. Um, stands out to me that those bugs that are longer duration and that involve changing hundreds of lines of code might be different in nature. Yes. In that they're, it's not, I screwed something up, I made a typo, it's the logic is wrong. That's right. And all the codes, all the lines of code look fine to the eye, but the assumptions built into them aren't, are contradicting, right? Exactly right, yeah. So, do you find that like static bug finders are better at those and then the statistic ones are better at those? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Because it, it seems like those would be hard for the statistical ones to find. Yeah, yeah. Just as it's hard for human eyes to scan what they find. Yeah, that might be true. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. Yes? Is, is the impact of this as a whole body of work on software quality and assessment, or does this have a tale to tell about how to move forward in a new design? So I, I think this is a kind of, I mean, uh, as far as statistical modeling of code and what you can use it for, um, I think it has application. For example, linguists are now interested in statistical NLP, right? Not code, but statistical NLP. Like, what, is it, what does that tell you about what is hard for people to read? You know, uh, what does it tell you about how people learn languages? They're very interested in that. So my feeling is probably similar lessons could be learned by statistical models of code, right? How do people learn code? What parts of code for, is hard for people to read? You know, I think those kinds of questions can also, how do you design languages? I think those kinds of questions are probably also, you know. But I think in looking at this, it strikes me at, at best, it kind of helps you do incremental improvements in a very derivative kind of, kind of sense. I mean, my experience with most big systems is that 90% of the code is dull and boring necessary, but lots of things in life are dull and boring. But the, the part of these applications that make them killer represents something which is very difficult, uh, brilliantly insightful, and the, it's the cornerstone upon which the whole rest of the structure rests. And, and if the conclusion of this is to say, well, don't don't do these complicated things because people have a hard time understanding them. It kind of says, well, make everything the dull and boring stuff because we understand how to do that well and communicate that well. I just, it just seems like there's a disconnect with 
things that provide genuine insight or the, the core value of an application? So I guess the way to think about this is, I mean, I, I, I see where you're going with this. I, I think, I think the, the way to think about it is, you know, can they use statistical methods to remove remove some of the more rote and boring jobs that programmers have to do, right? So, you know, maybe we can do a lot of code completion and save your time. Uh, maybe we can provide an initial cut port of something from Java to C Sharp so you don't have to think about it. Maybe we can go through a JavaScript program that has no type annotations and provide 80% of the type annotations and type check them and make sure they're okay. And then you can go off and finish the rest of it. You know, we'll do all the boring stuff because we've seen it every time before, right? So. Um, you know, the other comment about, you know, the other point about how the really challenging part of talk, uh, for, you know, like, somebody went off and did the Android architecture, you know. <laughs> Building an Android app now is easy because they did it right, right? So are we going to solve that problem with this kind of stuff? No, we don't have enough data. We don't have enough architectures to go off and figure out what makes a good architecture, what makes a bad architecture. But given that the Android architecture is there, can we help programmers avoid, make mistakes? Yeah, we can. Let me ask you about uh, a subtopic that you just touched on. Um, so I was interested in the millions and billions of code talk. It suggested there's lots of data. In a couple places in your talk, you mentioned process. Are there millions and billions of examples of code together with the process that generated it? Well, it depends on what you mean, right? I mean, so, you know, what you can find is commits and commit logs and bug fixes and so on. You can find lots of those. Yeah, um, that's post-hope. How about generating the code in the first place? Well, so, you know, anything that happened between commits, we don't know. You know, uh, some people are trying to instrument IDEs and gather that data. Um, I think some of that is, exists at Microsoft. Um, but, you know, programmers may not be, you know, even, even commit history gets rewritten, right? So mm -hmm. often we only have access to the completely rewritten history. We don't even know what goes on before they squash the commits or reorder the commits, we don't know that. So, you know, um, to the extent that people are be able to instrument IDEs and gather data, you know, then we'll get more data on the people actually code. I don't know if that's what you mean by process, but. Well, you know. no, I mean, it was before the first commit. What happened ah, before the first okay, commit? Ah, okay, okay, okay. What's the process yeah. for generating code? Yeah, I think it's hard to know. Uh, okay, yeah, you, I think you said at one point that Microsoft did a study where they looked at their process. Their, their process was one of the variables that they controlled. So what I meant by that was what I meant by that was what they could learn about process of code writing after the first commit. You know, so in other words, they have you know the history on how changes are made, who made those changes. You know, so when you look at when you look at uh, process history for project in GitHub and want to distinguish between, say, Java and C-sharp, we have to control for those factors, you know, like the number of committers, you know, the experience of the committers, and the, we have to control for those because those will affect the you know, quality outcomes. We know they do, and we want to control for those when we want to tease out the effects of language. So uh, we have a social hour uh, right after this downstairs. Uh, please join me in a great talk. Debbie has some announcements. Um, the next ISR Distinguished Speaker will be on February 5. It's Judith Bishop from Microsoft Research. And the title of her talk is Open Source Software and Industry Exploring the Reality. If you're interested, there's a flyer out on the table and there's um, a flyer for her specific talk as well. And the social hour is downstairs.